Um, but I, what I'd like to do to start with, Mayor Sue has been so uh, instrumental in supporting innovation, entrepreneurship, uh, talent development, which he's going to be talking about in Ann Arbor, uh, that I'd like to, before I introduce you, I'm going to have a few people come up who have been running businesses and just each going to take one minute. Uh, so the folks that I asked, would you please all come up? I hope you remember who you are. Uh, and uh, we're going to just have them talk a, a little bit about their business and uh, some of them have connections directly to U of M. Uh, others are uh, supported by the efforts that U of M brings. So I'm just going to start and uh, maybe it could have um, the youngest, but the, the youngest but best looking of this group, uh, Dick Sarnes and Mark Sutter, who are actually <laughs> one is the best looking and the other is the youngest. I'll just figure out which is which. Here, but, uh, and maybe you guys could uh, introduce yourselves and say a little bit of what you're doing, and also some of the connections between the two of you and also U of M. It's Mr. Sarnes. Good morning. And it's really a pleasure to have this opportunity to say a few words about uh, Ann Arbor and our connection with uh, long-standing connection with the University of Michigan. Uh, we came, my wife and I came to Ann Arbor in 1952, and uh, we started our business in 1960. And it was through the connection with uh, physicians at the University of Michigan Hospital that really entrusted me work on their medical devices. So that evolved into a business that uh, I'm fortunate to say is here today. And Mark Sutter is president and CEO of Trumo Cardiovascular. And uh, maybe you can say a few words about that. Thank you. Um, yeah, so Trumo Cardiovascular is on the west side of Ann Arbor. Started back with Dick Sarns in 1960. Now is a, a global, uh, about a half a billion dollar company uh, leader in cardiovascular business right here in Ann Arbor. So Michigan is a foundation for a lot of the things that we do. Um, I'm a graduate from Michigan a couple times, and um, we have programs. We've enjoyed several math programs from the University of Michigan. They've done some great job, a uh, great job for us, helping us look at an acquisition that we later were able to do. Um, we have a relationship with the bioengineering department where we bring students in on a regular basis, and they do some work for us in, in their labs. Uh, from the engineering department, and then a very important relationship with Dr. Beauvais and the cardiac surgery department. They're the they're the best in the world, really, in, in terms of pediatric cardiac surgery and and overall cardiac surgery. So, having a company in this uh, this area and having the kind of partnership we can have with the University of Michigan is um, a big advantage to a global company. So, thank you, Mark. How many you guys are employing quite a few folks these days? Maybe you just say just the uh, numbers. So we, we have um, a couple thousand in the cardiovascular company and there's 83,000 overall. Um, here in Ann Arbor, we have about a thousand uh, and that's grown by uh, about 300 over the last two years. So um, a big growth in the area and again, um, a key part of that growth is this cardiovascular area. So. Hey Dick, you want to say what your new business is? He's not done yet with his entrepreneurship. But. <laughs> well, we started a business about 20 years ago in, in the rehab side. So it started out with cardiovascular rehab. And uh, we developed equipment that's better suited for that population. And I'm happy to say that we have about 100 people in our co company now. And uh, we're a global company. Uh, we had, we sort of we have about 100,000 people per day using a new step, so we feel we're quite proud of that. And uh, Dick is in uh, the third quarter of life because he's probably got one or two startups left before, uh, before he decides to retire. So, uh, Scott, I'd, just if you could come up here, because I'm going to try to do some connections here, but Scott Mertz is also. Uh, Sort of an outgrowth of this. So maybe you could say what you're doing and some of the connectivity uh, with your medical device world. Sure. Yeah, I'm Scott Murs. Uh, 20 years ago, I was a graduate student here in engineering at the university and uh, wanted to commercialize a medical device we were working on. And so we went to 
the technology management office, as it was known at the time, which was three people tucked away in a hard to find building down on campus. Uh, so fast forward 20 years and we're, we're a small group, but a group of uh, design engineers who focus on medical device development and now manufacturing. And we collaborate with uh, groups like Trumo and try to, try to serve and support them. But another function that we have is working with physician inventors and student inventors out of the university. So we're, we're closely with technology transfer, which has grown quite a bit since the time. And to help them form their business and, and prototype their ideas and get them off the ground. It's just some of the way that the university weaves uh, its uh, good, good, uh, good deeds throughout the community. And uh, Scott and Mark and Dick have all been part of some of my small groups, so I'm very proud to uh, be part of that effort as well. Um, Robin, I'm going to introduce, and uh, Robin I've known since she was a child actually in Ann Arbor, and it's a story of uh, bringing people back to Ann Arbor to uh, keep talent here. So maybe Robin, you can just introduce yourself and say what your business is. Yeah. I am Robin Weber Pollock, and uh, my parents started a really great business while they were in grad school at the University of Michigan 35 years ago. It's an international adventure travel company. They had been in the Peace Corps in Nepal, and, and their friends here would ask them about this place they had lived, and so they decided that they would try taking small groups to see it, and it would be a way for them to get back. Well, the word ecotourism didn't exist then, but that's basically what they were doing. And now, 35 years later, they are ready to retire from this, uh, from this life's work. Yeah, it's Jour Journeys International. No, yeah. So. And, uh, and Has anybody been on a Journeys so, trip in here? Yeah, okay, great. Where'd you go, Paul? I uh, went to Nepal and I've been to Africa. Well, you've done three trips with them. Thank you. <laughs> so you, you paid for your first time on top. So this year is an exciting year for us. It's our 35th anniversary, and we're planning in September to welcome all of our partners from around the world to Ann Arbor so that they can meet each other and so that travelers that maybe have gone to their countries can reacquaint themselves with their guides that they loved some point in the past. Uh, we'll also have some community events, so keep your eye out September 27th to 29th for fun things going on uh, with stories from the world. <coughs> All right, well, thank you, Robin. And uh, you guys, the people who've talked, you can go ahead and take your seats and we'll talk to see who's still here then. And uh, so uh, we have, I'm going to go to this side. So uh, we're also highlighting some, some good news. Uh, and Tarumo's growth is one of those pieces of good news. Journey's growth is another. And uh, Bill Brinkerhoff, uh, you've got some good news to share with us. Bill, I first met when I was working with uh, Experian Therapeutics, uh, and uh, that company has spawned some great work, and uh, let us know what's going on. And so my name is Bill Brinkerhoff, uh, president of AlphaCore Pharma, and the news that we have from the last time is that AlphaCore was acquired by AstraZeneca, um, and it's a success story for the science, and also, you know, it's a group of scientists who uh, were with Pfizer, they were on the Lipitor team, uh, we worked together also at Asperion, um, that decided not to take the offer to move to Groton. They wanted to make their career here um, and funded the company um, through angel investing uh, in 2007 um, and brought this scientific program forward that has the hope to regress plaque rapidly um, that would prevent future heart attacks. So it stabilizes people that have severe atherosclerosis um, and we had a, a competitive process this, this spring and it resulted in the acquisition of the company. Um, but it shows, I think, that uh, the science uh, coming out of Ann Arbor is world class. Um, that uh, We had companies coming to our doorstep from all over that wanted to take this program in. And, uh, and I think the, uh, it's one of the I think, success stories that can hopefully draw more investors and companies and startups that show you can have success here. So thank you. Let's give Bill a hand and congratulations. And uh, a number of people here are working with, with me. I'm very fortunate to have this great talent to draw on. And Bill and I are uh, an advisory board for Elka's company, and Elk, which has just spun out. So maybe Elka, you can tell us what you're up to. And the story of the link to the university. Great. Good morning. So we just spun out a new company last month, Synovia Therapeutics. It's derived from the left and Sina without and fear, short for virus, um, without virus, so it's an antiviral treatment. But we have been, this research has been coming out of more than 20 years 
um, of research at Therapeutic System Research Laboratory, which was originally a spin-out from the University of Michigan. We have close collaborations with the College of Pharmacy, with the medical school. We have a lot of research projects that are NIH funded that we work in, in collaboration with the university on. And this lead candidate, this influenza compound, is now moving towards the clinic. And therefore, we spun out the new company to focus on that development. And so just to frame that for you, I, I wanted to ask you, how many of you have gotten a flu shot last year? All right, about 30%, that's pretty much the average. How many of you think that this flu shot would actually protect you from this novel strain of bird flu that we've been reading about in the last few weeks? We don't have any vaccines for that new strain yet. It's starting to be as fatal as the prior one, and people are saying now that it might have acquired the ability to spread from human to human, and so it could become a really serious global pandemic. Um, and so Sinovir is focused on developing a novel influenza treatment. It's not a vaccine, but it's something we can give when people are sick and when the virus is spreading to relieve symptoms and to stop the virus from spreading around the world. So, um, we're very excited to move this candidate forward. We're going to on Sunday to Bio in Chicago. We have four companies lined up that we want to talk to about co-development. Cool and try to move this candidate to the clinic. So, and John, you want to just raise your hand there because John Hilfinger is, uh, we've been, what, 25 years with that company, right? Yeah. Uh, not quite that. Not, not quite that. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's another story is that John and uh, Paul Friedman, several people have started companies that are now over 20 years old uh, and working with university people originally. Uh, and Bruce Gordon's last name is, uh, Gordon Amadon, a very famous professor at, at the school. And I also want to give Elka a, a hand for that great elevator pitch. So I'm going to give her. Uh, she won't mind, I think, if I, I brag a little bit because the other day I said, oh, I want you to speak. And she, she said, oh, I, I don't like doing that. So we worked for about an hour on an elevator pitch. I think she did a great job. <laughs> So uh, let's see, let's go to Mr. Newman. We've got to line up here. So Mr. Newman, another grad at the university. Uh, indeed. Uh, yes, I'm Chuck Newman and a PhD dropout in engineering school. <laughs> uh, running my company at the time was more demanding than, and also much more interesting. In fact, more lucrative. Um, and I've uh, sent four children to the University of Michigan. Among them and their spouses, there are four Ross MBAs. Uh, we don't have competitive board games in our house. And um, one of those, my youngest son, Mike, started a company called Stigret, whose mission is to empower people to attach digital media to their everyday world, which I mentioned in a prior meeting. I am responsible for the product line, which will allow individuals to leave their legacy in the form of recorded stories. These stories can be audio, they can be video, they can be new recordings, they can be excerpts from um, old beta tapes or cassette tapes or whatever. And uh, just an example of the power of this approach and how it works, I have uh, an interview with my uncle who fought in Germany in World War II, and his description of his military service is attached to one of our products, which is a label that goes on the bayonet that he gave to his grandson in the Australian Army. So that 70 years from now, in some indefinite point in the future, whoever has that bayonet will be able to hear my uncle in his voice talk about his military service. We are having some free workshops next Thursday, um, one during the day and one during the evening, and I'm going to encourage you to see me, pick up a flyer, and attend you will leave with some recording uh, that is about a person or a thing that's important to you that will exist uh, to the extent that we can predict such things in perpetuity. Thanks, Chuck. And one of the um, products that we hope to bring out of that is uh, recordings of legacy. So, for example, uh, we're, we're talking to uh, the Sardis family about, uh, you can imagine when you go to Terumo and you see one of the original uh, heart lung machines that developed in the 50s that you could be able to click on a, uh, a QR code on that and, and see Mr. Uh, Sarns, 
discussing uh, the formation of that. And that's the kind of technology that this will enable. Um, so, you know, all the inventions that we have in town, uh, instead of just reading a plaque, you can actually see the inventor uh, talking about what they're doing. So it's, it's a really cool technology, one I'm pretty excited about. Yeah. Uh, I have a request. One of the applications we're exploring right now is for seniors to, instead of just signing a yearbook, leave a video or an audio tag in it. So if any of you have or know of high school seniors I could speak to, I'd very much like to do that and learn a little bit about their thinking about this approach. It's good because my 20th is coming up soon, so... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Andrew? <laughs> Thanks, Rob. Uh, my name is Andrew Bank, and I'm also a grad of uh, the engineering school. And um, my partner and I graduated both in engineering. He's a two-time grad, and we started a company right out of engineering school at the corner of um, Oakland and Hill, in fact. And we grew that, and then it was called Tech Street. We grew that and sold it to Thomson Reuters. And then we kind of did our own things. We're getting back together now, getting the band back together. Um, we are basically helping consumers get all the discounts they deserve from their memberships. So people are spending lots of time hunting for coupons, whether they're shopping offline or online. But the fact is, pretty much everybody in this room is entitled to lots of stuff, lots of savings, that you're simply, you simply deserve without going and hunting for a coupon, but most people aren't getting them. So lots of people here have an M card. The M card gives lots of discounts around town and nationally, about 200 local and national dis discounts. We all have, lots of people have AAA, AARP, REI, Costco, Alumni Association, Professional Association. Um, all those things give lots of perks and discounts, but there are too many to keep track of, and nobody can remember to use them at the right time and place. So we have a free service, it's a website called Larky, L-A-R-K-Y. It's a free website and a mobile app that basically alerts you when you're entitled to a discount. So it's a very, a very uh, set it and forget it philosophy. You sign up, there are no account numbers or passwords required. You just tell us what you're a member of, and you just let it go and it works for you. So whether you're online or whether you're walking around town, it'll tell you, you know, you walk into some place, you walk into Plum Market, it'll say, oh, Mary Sue, don't forget, you have a 5% discount here, compliments of your Blue Cross Blue Shield membership. Does anybody know that you get a Blue Cross uh, discount at Plum Market? That was, you didn't say AARP, that was good. No, she's much too young for that. I'll, otherwise, I've been getting solicitations this year. Uh, so it's totally free, and uh, the flip side of it is that we work with the associations who want to increase awareness and increase usage of all these discounts. So we actually have a meeting with the MCAR team on Monday, a uh, meeting with the DNR passport, the recreation passport, because then we know that about 30% of people here have opted in. They pay $10 extra when they renew their license plate, they get free access to state parks. Anybody do that? Yeah. Did you know that you have discounts at 1,200 merchants around the state, including Bivouac and Dunham's and lots of others? Of course you did because the DNR is not a real tech-savvy marketer, so, so we're, we're hoping we're going to be working with them to do that as well. Um, so check it out. It's totally free. Uh, Larky.com, L-A-R-K-Y. Another example of a great elevator pitch there. Andrew, so, so let's see, we've got uh, Doug, another exciting company spinning out here on the Today Show recently. Hi, good morning. Uh, good morning, my name is Doug Cass. Um, I'm one of the founders of a new toy company here in Ann Arbor. I'm real proud of that. Uh, Cahoots, it's called. So uh, I get the award for having the funnest name for companies. Uh, my first company was 2002 with partner Josh Kulkender and also Phil Jenkins, some of you may know. Uh, we started Giddy Up in 2002. Giddy Up was a really fun adventure. 2006, we became part of the Elmer's group of companies, basically out of Columbus, Ohio. Sorry about, sorry about that, but <laughs> became part of Elmer's. And Elmer's then, um, over the next four or five years, decided to get out of the kids' toy business. So unfortunately, Giddy Up, the pieces of parts were sold. So that landed me here about two years ago, a year and a half ago, at one of these events, and I met Len Middleton and had coffee with Len, and, and Len looked at me and said, what are you doing? Start another one. You know, this community needs you to start another toy company. So literally from one of these meetings, I uh, had the inspiration to pull my partnerships back together, pull people back into the business, and started a company called Cahoots, which the basis of the business is to take a consumer idea of a children's toy, and general, which is our expertise uh, from a product standpoint, a sourcing standpoint, and bring it to market. So our first project is a partnership with Hasbro. Uh, you may know it's one of the largest toy companies based in Providence, Rhode Island, and they licensed the Spirograph brand to us 
This biograph was launched in 1965, became toy of the year in 1967. So out of our little office uh, south of town near Costco, we're shipping spirographs right now for the first time in about 20 years. And I brought one today, so. She's all right. There we go. And I brought a few actually, so so the original Spirograph kit, again, uh, they sold about 50 million units across the country. As a company, we're relaunching this. <clears throat> so Spirograph is a brand that's got 47 years of excellence. The, the, the thing that I'm <clears throat> most excited about is we now have eight employees in our office. Uh, we're creating, we do the product development. Uh, we are sourcing in China. Uh, we were very proud, Len connected us, and we were part of the, the MAP program this last fall. We had four of his students analyze our business. Um, presented a 72 page presentation to us after four or five months of looking at it. Thankfully we were still in business and it was a positive presentation. <laughs> I was a little nervous. I went to the presentation with a few other alternatives. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but they were very enthusiastic and very helpful in helping us to understand um, you know, taking the business and business today and the children's toy business is a very simple business. I've been in for about 30 years fortunately, but yet it's changed and how people sort of products and do different things. So they challenge us in many ways to get connected to social media, uh, to website. I mean, our biggest customer today is Amazon. So you go on Amazon.com, put in Spirograph, and it'll come, our kit will come right up. Um, as Rob mentioned, I mentioned, we were on the Today Show on Monday. It's one of the featured toys of the year. So we're very excited. Again, I'm glad it all originated from here. And we've got eight employees and hopefully more coming soon. So let me give you uh, all a uh, kind of a age question. How many remember uh, Dave Garraway on the Today Show? All right, so this is one for you. So, who, who is Dave Garraway's uh, partner? Do you remember? Chip. I'm hearing it. A chimp. He had a chimpanzee, so Matt Lawler shouldn't feel that bad, right? <laughs> uh, yeah. 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 you remember that? Are you, are you back those days, Bruce? <laughs> Yeah. Was it a child? A child. <laughs> yeah, I was right. So uh, we've got a couple more here, and we're, we're, let's wrap it up. And Dan and Marie, good news on each of their fronts. Thanks, Rob. I always like it when somebody starts out wrap it up. You know, yeah. Wrap it up. <laughs> so <laughs> thanks, Rob. <laughs> Between you and Gator is right. Right. <laughs> well, my name is Dan Arbor, and I. Uh, purchased uh, five years ago the uh, assets of uh, the ProQuest company and took the uh, Zeep Road facility private from that company. It got me into the entrepreneurial life of Larry Eiler here in town with Eiler Communications and essentially established a new firm focused on intellectual property assets and that is the uh, Apogee Insights firm. So we have about five other associates in the firm. What we find in intellectual property assets is that it's not difficult to identify those assets with many company presidents and people who have developed them, it's really difficult to change the mindset of those people in terms of looking at new markets, looking at new customers, and looking at new endeavors for them to look at. So we make direct investments with companies. We actually, in many cases, try to secure first customers with those individuals to really make sure that the application works. And the other thing is the final element is obviously to get expanded funding and uh, look for those markets as well. So we're very excited about Ann Arbor as a hub to this activity. Um, I don't have a U of M connection other than the company I started with was founded by Eugene Power, which we all know is uh, very affiliated with the Universal. Thank you. Marie, come on over, Marie. Marie is uh, another person we've been able to lure into town here and some, doing some great new work. I just wanted to announce what you're up to. So my name is Marie Cloth, and I am the new president and CEO of the Ann Arbor Art Center. And I'm also a graduate engineer, but my colors are the other colors of the state of Michigan. But anyways, I'm very excited to be here in Ann Arbor. And I don't know um, if any of you are familiar, but it's a 100 year plus old organization in continuous operation. And I've spent the last five years of my career very involved in the entrepreneurial ecosystem. And one thing I know for certain, if you don't te take technology and put it together with creativity, you won't get innovation. So one of the really exciting things, and stay tuned, check out the website, is that we are really, there was a project that came out of Harvard called Project Zero, and it really talks about habits of the mind. And it talks about the value of art and innovation and creativity. Art teaches children how to deal with ambiguity. It teaches them to deal with when there's no right or wrong answer. It teaches them to push through an unknown. So these are great you know, 
know, these habits of mind we're going to be incorporating into all of our educational programming. And we serve K through gray, which I stole shamelessly from the arts engine. And, uh, and I'll also say that I think Marvin, who's been a great guy and been a wonderful mentor to start with, but um, I was going to say. No, I was going to say one of the things with the Ann Arbor Art Center is that we really do want to preserve the history of the Art Center, but allow for change. So stay tuned. A couple people that were mentioned, uh, Lynn Middleton, Richard Hand, Lynn. Lynn uh, is uh, on the faculty at the Ross School of Business, uh, multi-time entrepreneur and a partner of mine in some pretty interesting ventures that we've been doing. Uh, Marvin Parnes is a associate, uh, is vice president of research and uh, has been working very closely with Mary Sue on uh, over one billion dollars last year. Uh, I don't know what, what's the trajectory for this year in terms Once of. you're over a billion, you know, you don't count. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I mean, in terms of. Uh, I don't know where it was when you. Be, what, what do you have any idea? Ten years ago, where that research funding was? Less than half. Less than half. So, in in Dr. Coleman's tenure, they doubled the uh, size of the research uh, amount of money coming into the university, which has been fabulous. We all in this room. If I could go around and see, almost everybody has some connection. I mean, the fact that this is CO Connect, and most of the people that are here are here because of university and either as, as students. I have my undergrad degree. Uh, it was in 2004, I think it was. Yeah. Uh, and uh, many people here have launched businesses as students, as you've heard. So it's been a it's been a, a wonderful uh, resource, and uh, we want to uh, thank you for all you've done. And the other thing I, I think is great is the campus looks so much better. I mean, you just think about how the campus looked in 2000 and how how beautiful it is now. The new buildings are great. Uh, the the buildings that are going up in the university are fantastic. I don't think some of the other ones that have quite the standards, the privately built ones, meet those standards, but. Uh, at the, uh, That's where it's cost so much. Yeah, well, <laughs> the new dorm, uh, you know, where old was used to stand, uh, the new uh, uh, Gerald Ford building, they're all just in fantastic buildings. And if you haven't been out to North Campus, you can walk out there because it's a dazzling display. So without further ado, okay. I appreciate your patience, but I thought you would enjoy hearing some of the folks that uh, you've influenced without probably knowing it. I'd like to present Dr. Mary Sue Coleman. Thank you. I brought some notes, so I want to make sure that I don't miss anything, but uh, I've long admired this group uh, because I think it's extraordinarily valuable for uh, people who do have that entrepreneurial spirit to come together and share what they're doing. And it's always inspiring for me to hear the amount of activity going on uh, in this community in, in ways that, I mean, who knew? We were the center for toys. I love it. I love it. You know, we, we sort of think about the high tech stuff and the and the pharmaceuticals and everything else as part of our legacy. But uh, but I love the toy story. So so let me give you just a little uh, a view of my journey and what I've been on in the last 11 years. First of all, I can't believe it's been 11 years. It seems like it's been about five minutes. And uh, and tell you where I think we are. As part of a university, but also I want to leave you plenty of time to ask me any questions that you'd like to ask me. So one of the first things that happened when I came in the fall of 2002 is I was summoned to, you will remember this, Marvin, I was summoned to a meeting of the External Advisory Committee for the Technology Transfer Office. And Fawaz Ulabi was the Vice President for Research. And I walked into the room, I think it was in the Union, we had this meeting, and there was this august group of people, one of whom was Rick Snyder, uh, who I just met on that day for the first time, sort of stared at me, uh, or glowered at me, and said, you know, the University of Michigan is not doing what it should do in tech transfer. That is, we do not have the kind of infrastructure, we, we have all these arcane rules, it's so hard for faculty to do anything, and you have to fix it. That was my charge. Uh, so, fortunately, I had in Fawaz a great partner, 
in terms of really beginning to look across the university in everything from how we treated inventors, how we took their intellectual property, the rewards that we gave them if their intellectual property was uh, remunerative. Uh, it, it, there were just so many things that needed examination and needed to be looked at. This is not easy with any university to change, uh, but in fact, over time, we have changed. And I think that we are in a far better, more robust place now, 11 years later, than we were when I came. And I'd just like to go through a few of those things because they're pieces that have to get put together. So in addition to changing all of the internal regulations, making it easier for people to transfer their technology, and, and actually having inventors share um, in the uh, profits from their technology, one of the things that we wanted to make clear is we wanted to make it easy for, for people to be serial entrepreneurs. And they wouldn't have to leave the university to develop their company. That they could do it and come back and do it again and again and again. And I think one of the stories I heard here today was how many people have done this over and over and over again. So we value the serial entrepreneur. We wanted to engage our students. And it's inspiring to me to see how many students have um, have really taken this on. The, one of the aha moments for me happened about seven years ago. I was at our freshman convocation and uh, Ted Spencer was going through his, you know, sort of list of how wonderful the incoming freshmen were. And he, he gave this statistic and he said, and 15% and, and of the young people sitting out in front of us coming to the university started a business while they were in high school. And I did the math, and there were about 600 kids, six to 700 kids in that audience in front of me who had started a business. And so my immediate thought was, did we beat the entrepreneurship out of them when they entered the university? That what were we doing to enhance it? And so then we started a whole series of programs to try to enhance this natural curiosity and natural ability that, the, that they have. So what are, what are we doing now? Well, so now we have TechArb, and TechArb is a space, a pretty spare space, uh, in a building close to the university that it encourages student companies. And at any one time, we have 30 to 40 student companies. Uh, some of these have been quite successful. Some of them have been bought. Some of them have achieved angel investors. Uh, it, but it's a hub, it's a constant space of innovation where students can go and live out their ideas and their dreams. And so that is one thing that I'm really, really proud of that we've done. We've had the Zell Lurie Institute for a long time. Uh, Sam Zell has helped to fund this through the business school. And that basically, uh, it deals with the graduate school, uh, master students who are interested in being entrepreneurs. We have a joint master's degree now for the first time offered between engineering and business that is just getting a huge take up in terms of young people who have engineering talent but want to be able to transfer this out and they need the skills. And so this is a way for them to gain those skills. We have the Center for Entrepreneurship that's housed in the uh, College of Engineering, but in fact, it is very broad based. We have thousands of students who participate and the Center for Entrepreneurship Programs, many of them are in LSNA, but they come over to engineering for these kind of activities. And our students are endlessly creative. I mean, one of the things that they started a few years ago is a thousand pitches. And a thousand pitches is a contest every year. It's up to three or four thousand kids now participate, in which they come up with business ideas. They present those ideas, they have to learn an elevator speech. And uh, we offer prizes for the best so that they can develop these ideas. So can you imagine how exciting it is to have three or 4,000 young people every year coming up with an idea that they would like to have for a business? Many of those have gone on and done, and done the same. We have the uh, Medical Innovation Center that uh, works within the medical school to try to give physicians an opportunity to let their dreams go forward. We have, uh, uh, let me see, oh yeah, the, the uh, 
the we have our newest program, which I'm also very excited about. Uh, this is one that Sam Zell helped to fund. It's called Zeal. It is the Zell Entrepreneurship and Law Program, and the idea was to have law students run a clinic that could help any entrepreneurs on campus, students or faculty, get free legal advice for setting up their companies. And so this is another way that we can, across the campus, use our strength to really help people who want to engage in this kind of activity. A couple of years ago, uh, things were going well and we're putting all the pieces in place. We've got, now with the Pfizer site, we were able to establish a venture accelerator for our faculty. We've got about 16 or 17 companies there, Marvin. Some of them have now begun to graduate out. You can only stay in that accelerated place for a limited period of time. We provide you all kind of services, but we want this to be a constant churn so that when you graduate, we throw you out and you have to go pay for your space. So, uh, so that, but the idea is to make it easy for people. Uh, but a couple of years ago, we decided that we were gonna make a university investment in these faculty companies. And so we started a program called MINTS, Michigan Envelopment in New Technology Startups, and this is how it works. We took $25 million from the endowment and, what, and I didn't do this uh, on a wing and a prayer. I actually uh, did a, a model study uh, because I wanted to be sure that I had a chance of success uh, because I didn't think that the people who had given to the endowment would be very pleased with me throwing their money away. Uh, so I didn't want to do that. But what we did is have an outside company uh, do a model for us and evaluate uh, if over the last 20 years, every startup company from a faculty member at Michigan, if we had done passive investing in every round, that is, every time the company got a venture capitalist or an angel investor, so they'd gone through the filter, we, make no, we would make no, no judgments, no assessments, no evaluation. But if the company got uh, investments from another entity that evaluated them, we would do an automatic investment at every round starting at 500000 going up to a million. And our model told us that if we had done that over the last 20 years, our annual rate of return would have been 17%. It's as good as our best, our best venture capital funds. And so there are a lot of failures. But there's some spectacular successes, and the successes carry you through and give you that return. So we felt confident that our research base was broad enough, that we had enough companies across the spectrum that we could do it. We started that a couple of years ago, and uh, we'll do it for any faculty member. And it's it's it, it, because we make no we we don't make any uh, evaluation. We're not picking and choosing. We're just saying you do it. We, you automatically get the money, and. Uh, I think that this has been an enormous uh, uh, boost for our faculty. They're very excited about it. And I think it's another way that we can show our commitment to what they're doing. We've had a lot of startups from the university. I mean, it's not a lot when you look at across the, the, uh, the community and see how many people have done things without the university participation. But since I came here, we've had about 115 startups from university faculty, and I think that's a good, it's a good sign. We hope that we get more, you know, in the future. The other thing that we have done that I feel pretty passionately about is about five or six years ago, we decided that we needed to join forces with Michigan State and with Wayne State and put our collector strengths together in the University Research Corridor. And this is a, it's a big program in which we are trying to encourage at all levels cooperation, particularly on really big things, big projects, but also to share our entrepreneurial expertise with each other and to help each other. And uh, I'm very pleased to say that that collaboration is going extraordinarily well. Our, our, our research VPs meet often. Uh, presidents uh, get together often. We do studies every year about the economic impact of these universities. It's now up to almost $16 billion a year, economic impact about in terms of you know, not only our research, but other aspects of the activity. And we're learning from each other, and we're learning how to get better at it. So um, I think what I'm going to do is basically to stop there and uh, be willing to take any questions that you have. But one of the things that's so exciting to me 
about sort of being in Ann Arbor and being in this community and being in Michigan, frankly, is that this is a place that really does have, you know, a big horizon, a big, uh, big ideas where people are not afraid to pursue big ideas and take risks because as all of you who start businesses out there know, you know, big risk, big reward is, is, is you've always got to be willing to take a chance. And uh, I think we try to do this at the university and we, we try to take, you know, well, well considered <laughs> risks so that we're not foolish about it. Uh, but we also think it's extraordinarily important for the future. Uh, but, uh, so I'll be happy to stop, and uh, if there's anything else you want to know about, I'll try to answer any questions. Okay. Well, actually, it'd probably be helpful if, if people would just come up, because we don't have to do the awkward, maybe just stand on the side if you have a question, and we could do it that way, or, or we could try to just pass it if you're close by. Uh, but I wanted to say thank you for the, uh, the messages that you're, you're doing and all the uh, actions that you're taking. And I was thinking about when you're talking about risk that uh, it resonated that I, when I was an undergrad here in actually 68, but uh, you know, the uh, uh, Dr. Stephen Kaplan, I don't know if he's still teaching in, in psychology, gave this class and you know, I kept wondering where's this class going? At the very end there was like an aha moment that he was, and it was that you have to act upon the environment. The environment it's going to act on you, but as human beings, the key is action on the environment. And that has really stayed with me in terms of uh, a message, you know. So it's these little things that, you know, in the, when we're at, at students that get planted that uh, shape our lives. And so uh, I just that, thank you for reminding me of that. Uh, questions? Where, where can we start? We're over here. Okay. Uh, Mr. younger side. Yeah. Okay. Yes, yeah, so I just quick question. How do you see the university embracing technology going forward in delivering education? And, and there's been a lot of conversation regarding that going on. Yeah. Sure. Um, you know, I think there's a frenzy in the media about it now. That's, uh, that's of course, I remember the days when. Uh, courses on television were going to absolutely revolutionize everything. In fact, I took a math course when I was in uh, junior high, offered through the TV. So this is new. Uh, so, so let me, uh, what is new though, and I think it's really quite fascinating, is what we've learned uh, about the way we learn through neuroscience and the way that information can be delivered via online technologies. So the University of Michigan's been experimenting for a long time with various forms of pedagogy, including online. We were the founding partners of Coursera, which is one of these big courses on the massive online open source, the MOOCs that you hear about and read about. So we've had a lot of experience. Scott Page, uh, one of our faculty members in political science, offered the first course, actually, through Coursera. We've had nine or 10 courses since then. Faculty are getting lots of it. experience with this. We've just, in fact, appointed an associate provost uh, to do our sort of digital uh, sort of experiments across the campus to try to coordinate things better. Faculty are very excited about this. Uh, we've had very good experience in combining, and I think what's going to emerge from this is a combination of the, of the online and the in-person. Uh, at the, at, you know, the, the experience that people love coming to the university is the one-on-one, -on -one, the groups, the people they meet. And, you know, I never had a student tell me they love that course that was online. I mean, never. And, and it's they love the professor, they love the, the students, they love the experience uh, of being on the campus. <clears throat> we did it through calculus, actually. And, and so the students do a lot of their problem solving uh, sort of online. And the, the software now is very sophisticated and can give us analytical information about what students are learning, what they're not learning, how the professors should change the in class time because of what's happening as the students uh, respond to trying to work through the problems. So this is very powerful, extremely powerful technology. It isn't any cheaper. I mean, the problem is that now we can take, you know, 300 kids in calculus, they can do the online problem sets, but when they do the one-on-one -on -one with the professor, now we want to have them in groups of 20. So it actually takes more people to teach it than it did the old way. But 
that's okay. I mean, it, as long as the educational experience is good, that's what we want. So I think there'll be a lot of experiments. I think this whole notion of people getting a college education free by taking MOOCs is sort of nutty. I mean, I, I, I don't know where people are coming from with that. I do think that this is a wonderful sort of public service we can do for the world, and particularly for people who don't have access to colleges and universities, they will have access to knowledge, and that's a good thing. Uh, it's a good thing for the human race. Um, so we're in this experimenting. We want to be part of it. We will be part of it. Uh, where it all ends up, I'm not sure. Yeah, okay. Jim? Yes, go ahead. Sure. Uh, Jim Price, I'm on the Zellery Entrepreneurship Faculty. Uh, I have about 150 students a year uh, in the MBA program who are all interested in entrepreneurship. And I know this is true also of undergrads, uh, that the biggest constraint they see when you talk to them, if you give them a small shot of sodium pentothal and ask them the real truth as to why they don't start businesses and go work for Kraft or Citibank, is that that is the student debt load overhang of $150,000 to $200,000. Is there anything that we can do at U of M or in the state of Michigan to ameliorate that, or it, could that be part of our consideration in the future? I have to tell you also, just check Jim, that it's medical sodium pentothal that they're using. So yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. <laughs> So I think the issue is different in, in, in with uh, graduate students, and particularly uh, students at the Ross School. There may be, you know, there may be an issue with debt. Um, at the undergraduate level, uh, you know, there's a lot of myths out there about what the debt loads are, and they're they're really they're under twenty five thousand, and only five percent of students have debt loads over a hundred thousand. So I, you know, I people I, I get a little bit upset when people say, you know, we're bankrupting a generation because I frankly think that a lot of this is manageable. Um, you know, clearly though, access affordability. The, our, uh, the ability of this next generation to thrive and survive is something that everybody's talking about. I mean, it is the, I was at the AAU meeting, which is the uh, president's meeting of the top 60 research universities, public and private, in the country. And this is on everybody's mind, what we can do to bend the cost curve uh, for higher education and make it affordable, uh, make sure that we have the right kind of fellowship and scholarship support. So. We're all grappling with ways to do this. Uh, I, I don't know whether states will get in the business of trying to forgive loans for people who stay or start businesses. Uh, there may be some new models that develop. I, I think we're all in this, uh, in this world of trying to you know, stop, solve what is a sticky problem uh, without you know, a silver bullet solution. Uh, but, I, but the other thing that I would hope is that young people uh, would not be, you know, so scared about the future that they would be unwilling, you know, to take the kind of risk, even with big student debt. I, you know, it, it, you've got a long life, I mean, and, uh, and what, what I thought was going to be possible when I got out of college and what ended up being possible were two pretty different things. Um, you know, the other thing that I that I tell students all the time is when I got a PhD, uh, nobody was hiring. I mean, it was a disaster. It, 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 and you know, this late '60s, early '70s, a disaster in the economy. And you know, on this ebb and flow, and things change, and possibilities. I mean, it isn't much comfort to people when they're starting, but uh, but but I do hope that we would continue to try to find uh, innovative solutions. And I absolutely believe that investing in oneself and getting a great education at law school is worth every penny, no matter what happens. I have a question for you. We had a conversation in a small group that I was part of yesterday about Ann Arbor. 
in what Ann Arbor as a community, Washtenaw County, the state can do more for to support the university because it's always the other way. And one of the things that came up was that we don't have a great uh, hotel downtown. I mean, Robin's talked about bringing a bunch of people in. It's hard to figure out where are those people. So I just wonder if you could comment on that other side of what you wish you'd have more of or more cooperation from the community to support what you guys are trying to do at the university. Well, it, it, you know, it's interesting. Uh, that's one of the things I hear a lot about hotels, uh, you know, from parents, from visitors, and uh, uh, whatever the dynamic is. I think that it would be fabulous for us to have more hotel space downtown, uh, and and with different kinds of hotels too. It would it would be really helpful. You know, I have felt pretty darn good about my relationship with the city. And uh, given what I know from other communities where there are pitched battles between universities and their surrounding neighborhoods and other places in the country, I think Ann Arbor is extraordinarily, uh, you know, sort of open-minded and helpful. Uh, the mayor and I have a good relationship. And so even though sometimes we, we have differences of opinion, I know I was quite astonished when there was all this concern about the solar array, the panels on Plymouth Road, because I made this big speech a year and a half before, and we're doing this, and it's going to be visible, and everybody will see our commitment to alternative energy, and then it was sort of a blowback. What? I mean, I, I mean I, it, it just the, 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 the disconnect sometimes. But, I understand those are the uh, voices. There may be people in this room who don't like the solar array. Yeah. But we are going to, to have landscaping. So I get it. Uh, you know, I get the fact that, that there are, that sometimes the university seems like it's the, it's the, big, uh, the big thing that is sort of pushing everybody else out of the way. Um, what we try to do is to be extraordinarily sensitive and I appreciated the comment about the buildings that we built because we built for a hundred years. I mean, we don't build buildings that we think are going to go out of style or that are going to be cheap or they're going to fall apart. <coughs> and once I get over the shock of the square foot cost of these buildings, <coughs> uh, then and we use high standards, uh, for our, for our, you know, we almost all are union uh, labor. We like union labor. We think they do a good job, and uh, they do. They, their buildings are beautifully, beautifully constructed, and and uh, and I'm pleased with the fact that that we don't go over budget. Uh, our buildings are on time, and I hope that the community can, can be proud of what we do. We we are we're going to keep growing. I mean, if we're successful, we'll keep growing. And I and, and I can't be, I don't want to have people think that we're just going to, you know, we've done all that we're going to do. We haven't. Uh, but we'll try to do it in a sensitive way. We had a question back here. Yeah. Uh, John Cunningham. I, I, uh, I, was, I have this memory uh, in the not too distant past of being in a meeting at Barton Hills and after Pfizer decided they were going to leave. And, you know, the community tried to rally around how are we going to fill this yeah. void? And certainly excited to see all the developments, um, you know, in the Pfizer facility. Can you speak at all about, you know, how the university plans to leverage that facility to, uh, sure. you know, and how the community can play a role in that? Sure. Uh, I, I, you know, it has happened so much faster than I thought it would uh, when we bought the property back in 2009. We thought it would take 10 years. I, I, I was pretty convinced that it was going to take a decade to really get it, uh, get it back up to speed. But it has, uh, we now have over 2,000 employees there. Uh, we have many robust groups. We brought, you know, groups of researchers together. Uh, our tech transfer is out there. All of our interaction with businesses. I think, you know, Marvin can try to yeah. tell me, but I think we, we used to have maybe interactions with a couple hundred companies a year. They were mostly the big companies. It's now in the thousands uh, because big companies, small companies, we, we will do whatever we can to sort of interact and help. 
So we've got all that activity, our accelerators out there. Uh, we have our new big health policy institute out there that houses about 500 researchers. We want to be the place in the country that does innovative health policy research. Uh, we've got a couple of uh, private businesses there, companies are renting space there. We've got a big cardiovascular, we've got a big imaging uh, group out there. Uh, so this is really moving. Uh, we haven't built any new buildings, but we do have 173 acres of land, and uh, we have plans for the future. We have a 50-year plan, and, uh, and we believe that that will become a very vibrant part of the campus and uh, it, it's, it's, it will be good for Ann Arbor. Yeah. Um, the, the question I'd like to ask you, uh, maybe picks up on Mr. Sarnes, but I'm a graduate of School of Natural Resources and I use that opportunity to work and live in Southeast Asia, in Indonesia. And so uh, I didn't realize until I got into those circles what a, what a hundred year history University has with Southeast Asia. One of my close friends, is the second point, was a Ross Herbred, is now consulting with a company called Aft and doing a great deal of work in Africa. And so my question, if I can form it, uh, is: I so Africa, Southeast Asia engine, guaranteed economic engine in Southeast Asia, Africa happening uh, economically. What uh, investments or long-term thinking? Is the university doing to continue to tap students, but also push, push out uh, University of Michigan um, uh, magic in those areas? And I, I think this may or may not be an accurate thing, but I watch with great interest and admiration on the um, sustainability efforts that are tangible. And I just wonder, uh, and it's an unformed thought, can you push sustainability out in these countries as well? Uh, so I just put that out to you. Really, and the first part is, what are you, what are we doing strategically in those developing areas, both education but also business? So, uh, so since I've been here, I made a couple, several trips to China. Uh, that's where we've got our most robust uh, activities. I'll talk about it in a minute. Uh, South Africa and Ghana, where we've been for a long time, we, and we do a lot of work there. Brazil, another rapidly developing economy and one in which we have our probably our most robust sustainability collaborations and then I'm going to India in uh, November so the activities vary across you know depending on on the country and how we think we can be find mutual interest I you know I think one of the hallmarks of the University of Michigan that I love so much is that we have never taken the attitude that we are here to show you how to develop it's always been a we want to we want to find something in whatever we do for both of us uh, you know you need the country needs to get something out of it we need to get something out of it together we'll do something better than any any of us and we've learned a lot uh, from being in these countries Our, in in, in uh, China we have the joint Institute at Shanghai Shaotong University it is our most robust collaboration and the one that we have put the most institutional resources in it's engineering. Uh, we've talked about possibly expanding to other areas, and we have a, a big medical institute at Peking University. Um, we have over a thousand students now a year at SJTU, and uh, in the institute, they get a Michigan engineering education. It is, but we, it has its own faculty. We're we're not dependent on sending our faculty back and forth. We send about 50 to 70 students there a year. Uh, from Michigan. They send about 100 students a year to us uh, to complete their two years. So there are a couple of paths. You can either get your degree solely at SJTU or you can get a joint degree uh, coming to Michigan. Uh, these students, we've now graduated enough of these students so that, that we know that they are in very high demand uh, in China and uh, are highly sought after by companies. So we're getting a very, very good reputation for the kind of education, inquiry-based education that we give. Very skilled graduates know how to solve problems. They know how to be Michigan graduates, because that's what they are. And we think that's the best thing that we can do. In addition, we've got a number of programs. We have very good relationships with the Ministry of Education, where we are trying to influence the development of education leaders in China. 
and we have them now all over the place because this program's been going on for about eight years. We're trying to help develop teaching techniques in China. We have another big program uh, where we help faculty members develop. So I, that, that has been enormously successful. In Africa, again, it depends on what the country needs. We have focused on social science research, humanities preservation of cultural, uh, the cultural uh, 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 sort of values of communities helping people use those, protect those assets. Uh, Ghana, we have a big medical relationship that's been going on for decades where we have educated uh, uh, physicians in women's reproductive health and the most important hallmark of that program is that 95% of the physicians have stayed in Ghana. They don't get an education and leave, which is what is the problem with many of these joint programs. In Brazil, as I said, we've got people working in the Amazon. We have very, very good uh, sustainability relationships there. And in India, we're going to be exploring. Mary Sue, you might just talk briefly about the Dow uh, gift a year ago in terms of the sustainability Indeed. leadership. Uh, that was a very big breakthrough. Uh, in which the Dow Foundation uh, is partnering with us and gave us $10 million to educate 300 graduate students in sustainability. These are competitive fellowships across the entire university. The field can be wide open and we want to send with Dow 300 people out into the world who can make a big difference in sustainability and push it out. Yeah, coming in. Uh, there's also this, the small links that grow, and one of them I've personally been involved in is Rwanda. Yeah. And uh, Lynn uh, Middleton has a project where a student uh, from uh, started, uh, brought a map team to Rwanda yeah. to, to help the government. And that grew into a leadership training program in Rwanda, which I was able to be involved in. And now in Rwanda, there's a grant through William Davidson Institute where they're training hundreds of women entrepreneurs. And my wife has started a not-for-profit in Rwanda. So these little uh, things just grow and you don't even, really, they don't even go on the map. So it's just a, amazing how that happens, yeah. Yeah, well, you know, when, when I went to Africa, we sort of put the call out because we wanted to know what faculty were working in Africa. And it turned out we were in 45 countries. That 125 faculty were in 45 African countries. And I, I mean, I, I, sometimes my breath is taken away with the power of, of what Michigan faculty do. Who would believe that? I mean, unbelievable. But it's Michigan. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, do you have any unfinished agenda items? And yes. Yes. Let me rephrase the question. What are your uh, top three unfinished agenda items? And, and if you were giving advice to an incoming president, because I might apply, what would you give him? Oh, listen, I'm going to stay away from the advice uh, to an incoming president. But, but I will tell you that I expect this next 15 months to be just as active as my last 15 months. And, and, and then the biggest item on I, my agenda, I, I, I hope all of you saw the announcement yesterday of the biggest gift in our history, $110 million from Charles Munger, who has become a great friend. And Char Charlie keeps telling me, he says, I'm 89, and I want to see this project finished. And so I am on a fast timeline to get the schematic design done by September and the construction finished in early 2015. So while I will not see the, the I won't be president when it gets done, I have got to get it in the ground and sort of out on the way. So that, you know, that's a big one. But but you know, obviously there are other things that, that we are doing at the university that are really important. I'm going to India in November and that's gonna be a big opportunity for us. I'm gonna be doing some searches for leadership within the institution that are really important. You know, I'm gonna be still advocating uh, at the uh, at the state level for funding for the university. We're starting a big capital campaign. Um, I'm, 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 I've got lots of people I'm targeting that <laughs> I will be talking to. Um, that, you know, and, and the thing that's so exciting about being at Michigan is that we've got this great donor base of people who want to make us better. And, you know, the fact that this year, I, I, I'm still just sort of 
astonished that we had a $50 million gift for the creative writing program. We have had a $45 million gift to name the School of Art and Design. You know, we, we've got others in the pipeline that it, they, they're, they're just going to change the, the, the face of the university in terms of its competitiveness to do what it needs to do. And, and the other thing that I'm, I want to get underway in, in the planning is the bicentennial celebration. It is only three and a half years away, 2017, and we want to have a year-long celebration. You know, it, it, you, you come up on these, you know, very rarely, and we want to take advantage of this great opportunity to, to highlight to the world what the University of Michigan means. So I don't, I'm not going to be uh, twiddling my thumbs. Uh, I'm going to be having a great, uh, great time. But you know, this university is such a precious asset. I, I can say that because I've been at other universities. And I understand why this university is different. And to protect it and nurture it and keep it and make it better all the time is the most important thing that all of us can try to do. Thank you very much for that. It's a passion. Uh, one of the aspects of what we do here is leadership development. I wonder if you could comment on maybe some of the leadership lessons you've learned uh, or you follow. Well, you know, in my in my long administrative career, though, I you know was a faculty member for a long time too, and I think that sort of gave me a humility that was really important. And I think the other thing that made me pretty humble along the way is the fact that uh, as a person who was totally dependent on securing grants by writing grant proposals and getting lots of rejections along the way, as well as uh, a lot of success, uh, that I that I learned first of all, you never give up. You don't say, I'm going to fold my tent. Uh, you have to be persistent. You have to listen a lot. Uh, I learned early on that the best way to move an organization forward is to lay out the options, ask people's opinions seriously, and listen to the opinions. Sometimes my mind is changed. Sometimes it's not. Uh, make a decision in a timely fashion. Get back to people and explain why you made the decision that you did because what I've learned over time is that what people want most is to be heard and to be respected for being heard even though they know that I will not always agree with the position. And uh, that lesson has served me well. I think I've learned to be as engaging and respectful of people, whether they're cleaning the buildings or whether they are giving a huge gift. And uh, I do understand that there are, for every part of the organization is made up of lots and lots of people who make it work. And it isn't a single individual. And, uh, and, for, and after that, uh, you know, just try to, to fight the battles and uh, die on the hills that are important uh, to die on. Don't try to die on too many uh, because you, you won't be successful. What have you done to keep yourself uh, sane and, you know, manage the stress? Well, you know, I have this great partner in life, my husband, uh, who is a, you know, just the most wonderful person I've ever met. I met him in college and I still think that. Well, I think we'll have been married 48 or 49 years. I can't quite remember this summer. <laughs> and, uh, uh, it's still a great relationship. And you know, for all of you have grandchildren, you know, you spend some time with your grandchildren and you sort of figure out what's really important to the world pretty quickly. <laughs> Other questions? Way in the back. Yeah. Hi, Marty. I'm Mike Bischoff. I'm with the Taubman Institute. And we just announced uh, that the FDA approved phase two of the ALS, the ALS trial that Eva Feldman talked about here a year and a half ago. So it's a big step forward. I want to say that none of this would have been possible without the leadership of President Coleman on important issues like stem cell research. She's really been an incredible leader with it on, on other issues of social importance like affirmative action. And I want to ask what do you think the role is of the college president in taking these kind of leadership uh, issues in the public? I, I, just, I, Marty, I couldn't quite hear the end of that. Oh, 
I'm sorry, what is the role of the pre president of the university in these kind of issues that are... You know, okay, the role, the role of the university president. Yeah, so, so, so I do think that, that it's important for presidents to be circumspect when they take on issues. Uh, because I understand very clearly that I am speaking for the university that it is very difficult for me to separate my personal from the official. And I have tried very hard to take positions, um, and public ones, and areas that I believe are of crucial and central importance, like affirmative action to the university, and uh, stem cell research. Now, I did have a personal issue there because my sister died of ALS, and so I, I've been deeply, deeply committed. But I've been committed because stem cell research, I'm a biochemist, I understand its promise, and I think we have to, we have to, to know whether or not this it, it will be important for therapies. Um, but, but you know, I am, I am besieged constantly by people who want me to take a stand on this issue or that issue or the, the topic of the day, and I try to be very, very selective because I, 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 I do understand when I take a position that how it will be interpreted, and my litmus test is to try to say, is this something important for the faculty or the or the advancement of the university, or for freedom of inquiry, or for meeting diversity goals that we think are so important for the society. And, 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 I, and I do think presidents need to speak up, but I think they need to be careful uh, about what they speak up for. President Coleman, I appreciate you being here. I realize we're about at the end of uh, about the time that you've given us, and I want to thank you very much for coming, and thank uh, Cynthia Wilbeck for making this happen. Uh, there's many, many people in the room that appreciate, and we could probably have a whole other hour of just appreciations, but we'll do that next year, all right? When, uh, yeah. uh, but it, it's, it's been a great experience, and so thank you for your candidness. And all. Thank you all for coming, and we'll be back here uh, next month uh, where we're going to have some of the business partners of Zingerman, the people who own the bakehouse, the candy shop, talking about what it's like to be a Zingerman partner. And I want to thank our sponsor, Zingerman's uh, United Bank and Trust. Uh, I think Pam and David are there for business banking, and Roger Rail, who's video this. And Roger, when do you anticipate this will be up and ready for folks? Uh, this month. All right, this month. <laughs> Usually he has it by Monday, but we'll listen. And uh, he's been a great partner in this. So thank you all for coming, and uh, we'll see you next month. Thank you. Are you out of the...